Today I'll be discussing hepatic encephalopathy. By the end of the video, you'll be able to describe the pathophysiology of hepatic encephalopathy, including its relationship to ammonia, to list its risk factors and clinical manifestations, and to prescribe appropriate treatment for a patient with encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy is a syndrome of altered neurologic function related to a dysregulation of metabolism seen almost exclusively in patients with severe liver disease. It's often a chronic problem in patients with cirrhosis, managed medically to varying degrees of success, punctuated with occasional exacerbations. Although these acute exacerbations are rarely fatal, they are a frequent cause of hospitalizations among patients with cirrhosis. There are many theories about the pathogenesis of hepatic encephalopathy, but ammonia plays a central role in all of them. Ammonia, much of which is absorbed from the gut, is normally converted to urea by the liver as part of the urea cycle. But in patients with cirrhosis and subsequent portal hypertension, portosystemic shunting develops in which collateral blood vessels divert venous blood from the intestines, bypassing the liver to directly enter the systemic circulation. The consequence of this is higher than normal concentrations of ammonia in the brain. This shifts the equilibrium in two critical enzyme-mediated reactions. First, it shifts the balance between the citric acid cycle intermediate alpha-ketoglutarate and the neurotransmitter glutamate towards the latter. Among other things, this results in a decrease in cellular oxidation and ATP production. The second reaction is one in which glutamate and ammonia are converted to the amino acid glutamine, specifically within astrocytes. For complex reasons, this results in cerebral edema and oxidative stress. Having gone through that, it's important to realize that ammonia is not the whole story. Consider this study in which 121 consecutive patients with cirrhosis who were admitted to a hospital for any reason had their ammonia levels measured and had the severity of encephalopathy determined by clinical exam. Here's what was found. Each dot represents one patient. I'll discuss the grades in a minute, but as you might guess, the higher the grade, the worse the encephalopathy is. Grade zero means that there is no detectable encephalopathy at all. As you can see, there is certainly a relationship between ammonia levels and severity of encephalopathy, but it's not perfect. For example, almost half of patients with no encephalopathy had elevated ammonia levels, and there were other patients with very severe encephalopathy with normal levels, including one who was literally comatose. So if the correlation between ammonia levels and encephalopathy is not perfect, what else might be going on? Well, some additional contributions to the pathogenesis of hepatic encephalopathy likely include altered levels of other neurotransmitters, increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, increased inflammatory cytokines, and alterations in the gut microbiome. There are many, many risk factors for developing encephalopathy. The biggest of these is a side effect of a procedure called TIPS, which stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, in which an artificial channel is percutaneously created between the portal vein and the hepatic vein. By decompressing the portal venous system, this procedure reduces the probability of bleeding from esophageal varices and makes ascites easier to treat. However, the risk of encephalopathy is much worse. Another risk factor that's localized to the liver is portal vein thrombosis for similar reasons. Other risk factors include acute infections, particularly spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, acute kidney injury and electrolyte derangements, particularly hypokalemia, GI bleeds in which encephalopathy could be triggered by what amounts to the ingestion of a large protein load, as well as from intravascular volume depletion, and both hypoxemia and hypercapnia. The role of protein intake in the development of hepatic encephalopathy is a debated topic. While there may be a minority of patients whose risk of encephalopathy is particularly sensitive to high protein intake, both the number of patients who fall into this category and the degree of risk are likely less than commonly believed. As individuals with cirrhosis generally have greater problems due to malnutrition, routine protein restriction is not recommended for most patients. This is a good spot to point out that a person does not need liver disease at all to suffer from encephalopathy related to high ammonia levels. Other causes of a clinically similar syndrome include inherited defects in the urea cycle, 
congenital portosystemic shunts, a side effect of the medication valproic acid, and some ureteral diversion procedures in which the urinary system is surgically connected to the GI tract. In this last case, urease-producing gut bacteria break urea and the urine back down to ammonia, which gets reabsorbed through the colonic mucosa. Regarding the clinical manifestations, they can be placed into four main domains. The level of consciousness and alertness, intellectual function, neuromuscular abnormalities, and personality and behavior. The classic physical finding of hepatic encephalopathy is called asterixis, which is an intermittent, abrupt, and brief focal loss of muscle tone. It's most commonly observed by asking the patient to outstretch their arms with wrists extended and to hold that position for 10 or 20 seconds. This is sometimes referred to as negative myoclonus. Importantly, asterixis is not specific for hepatic encephalopathy, but can also be seen in other forms of toxic metabolic encephalopathy, including uremia and hypercapnia. The overall impression of the severity of the manifestations in these four domains are often graded on a four-point scale, as briefly mentioned a minute ago. In grade one hepatic encephalopathy, patients are generally alert but have sleep irregularities, such as sleep reversal, in which they are prone to nighttime insomnia and daytime sleepiness. They have mild confusion, which may go unnoticed unless specifically tested. Speech may be mildly slowed, and those patients nearing grade two will start displaying asterixis, which continues as the severity worsens. Patients with grade one encephalopathy may also display some mild personality changes. In grade two, attention span becomes reduced, which can be picked up with tasks such as calculating serial sevens or the animal fluency test. Patients will have moderate confusion that can be picked up within a few minutes of conversation. Speech will be slurred and they may be exhibiting some ataxia. As they approach grade three, walking without assistance may no longer be safe. These patients may also exhibit disinhibition by saying or doing things that are socially inappropriate and out of character for them. In grade three, patients are sleepy but still arousable. Confusion is severe and immediately apparent. Speech is often so slow and dysarthric as to be incoherent. A variety of bizarre behaviors can be observed during periods when the patient happens to be awake. And last, grade four encephalopathy is when the patient has progressed to coma. How does one diagnose hepatic encephalopathy? Well, it's a clinical diagnosis, which means that there is no confirmatory diagnostic test. Instead, diagnosis is based on the presence of consistent symptoms and signs in a patient with known advanced liver disease and in whom other alternative diagnoses have been ruled out. While the presence of an elevated ammonia level and or asterixis is supportive of the diagnosis, neither of these findings are necessary nor sufficient. For a patient who presents to the hospital with either new onset or an acute exacerbation of hepatic encephalopathy, what treatment should be started? You can divide up treatment into interventions which are not specific for hepatic encephalopathy and those which are. In the former category is obviously supportive care, which means delirium and fall precautions. A swallow evaluation with or without an altered diet is usually appropriate in grades two through four. And grade four patients require intubation and mechanical ventilation. Also treat the underlying predisposing conditions, if any can be identified, and provide adequate nutritional support. Although it's often done, in general, protein intake should not be limited. Moving on to treatment options that are specific for hepatic encephalopathy, by far the most commonly used is lactulose. It's administered as an oral liquid, usually in either a 30 or 45 milliliter dose, given two to four times per day, which is then titrated to maintain two to four bowel movements per day. In patients who are unable to safely swallow, it should be given via nasogastric tube or alternatively via enema. Another option is the non-absorbable antibiotic rifaximin, which presumably kills off urease-producing bacteria in the gut, reducing ammonia production. Anecdotally, rifaximin takes much longer to work than lactulose and is probably better for long-term chronic maintenance rather than for treatment of acute exacerbations. This is also true for third-line agents, neomycin, and branched-chain amino acids. I'll end the video by going over the mechanism of action of lactulose. 
lactulose, also known as beta-galactoside or fructose, is a non-absorbable carbohydrate that can be metabolized by normal gut bacteria, resulting in lactic and acetic acids being released into the gut lumen. This lowers the pH of the lumen, which then shifts the equilibrium between uncharged ammonia and charged ammonium ion. Since the absorption of the uncharged species is relatively high compared to the ionic form, this reduces the overall amount of ammonia that's absorbed. Other possible contributing effects include decreased GI transit time due to lactulose's cathartic actions, which then decreases time for ammonia absorption, an increased uptake of ammonia by gut flora, and displacement of urease-producing bacteria, which break down urea into ammonia, by non-urease-producing species. That's it for this video on hepatic encephalopathy. Be sure to check out my other videos on the acute complications of cirrhosis, including SBP, hepatorenal syndrome, and upper GI bleeds.